The Vision of Columbus, a poem in nine books, by Joel Barlow. Every circumstance relating to the discovery and settlement of America, is an interesting object of inquiry. Yet it is presumed, from the present state of literature in this country, that many persons, who might be entertained with an American production of this kind, are but slightly acquainted with the life and character of that great man, whose extraordinary genius led him to the discovery of the continent, and whose singular sufferings ought to excite the indignation of the world. The Spanish historians, who treat of the discovery and settlement of South America, are very little known in the United States, and Dr. Robertson's history of that country, which, as is usual in the works of the judicious writer, contains all that is valuable on the subject, is not yet reprinted in America, and therefore cannot be supposed to be in the hands of American readers in general, and perhaps no other writer in the English language has given a sufficient account of the life of Columbus to enable them to understand many of the necessary allusions in the following poem. Christopher Columbus was born in the Republic of Genoa about the year 1447, at a time when the navigation of Europe was scarcely extended beyond the limits of the Mediterranean. The mariner's compass had been invented and in common use for more than a century, yet with the help of this sure guide, prompted by the most ardent spirit of discovery, and encouraged by the patronage of princes, the mariners of those days rarely ventured from the sight of land. They acquired great applause by sailing along the coast of Africa and discovering some of the neighboring islands, and after pushing their researches with the greatest industry and perseverance for more than half a century, the Portuguese, who were the most fortunate and enterprising, extended their discoveries southward no farther than the equator. The rich commodities of the East had for several ages been brought into Europe by the way of the Red Sea and the Mediterranean, and it had now become the object of the Portuguese to find a passage to India, by sailing round the southern extremity of Africa and then taking an eastern course. This great object engaged the general attention of mankind, and drew into the Portuguese service adventurers from every maritime nation in Europe. Every year added to their experience in navigation and seemed to promise a reward to their industry. The prospect however of arriving at the Indies was extremely distant, 50 years perseverance in the same track, had brought them only to the equator, and it was probable that as many more would elapse before they could accomplish their purpose. But Columbus, by an uncommon exertion of genius, formed a design no less astonishing to the age in which he lived, than beneficial to posterity. This design was to sail to India by taking a western direction. By the accounts of travelers who had visited India, that country seemed almost without limits on the east, and by attending to the spherical figure of the earth, Columbus drew this conclusion, that the Atlantic Ocean must be bounded on the west either by India itself, or by some great continent not far distant from it. This extraordinary man, who was now about 27 years of age, appears to have united in his character every trait, and to have possessed every talent, requisite to form and execute the greatest enterprise. He was early educated in all the useful sciences that were taught in that day. He had made great proficiency in geography, astronomy and drawing, as they were necessary to his favorite pursuit of navigation. He had now been a number of years in the service of the Portuguese, and had acquired all the experience that their voyages and discoveries could afford. His courage and perseverance had been put to the severest test, and the exercise of every amiable and heroic virtue rendered him universally known and respected. He had married a Portuguese lady by whom he had two sons, Diego and Ferdinand, the younger of whom is the historian of his life. Such was the situation of Columbus, when he formed and thoroughly digested a plan, which, in its operation and consequences, unfolded to the view of mankind one half of the, globe, diffused wealth and dignity over the other, and extended commerce and civilization through the whole. To corroborate the theory which he had formed of the existence of the Western continents his discerning mind, which always knew the application of every circumstance that fell in his way, had observed several facts which by others would have passed unnoticed. In his voyages to the African islands he had found, floating ashore after a long western storm, pieces of wood carved in a curious manner, canoes of a size unknown in that quarter of the world, and human bodies, with very singular features. Fully confirmed in the opinion that a considerable portion of the earth was still undiscovered, his genius was too vigorous and persevering to suffer an idea of this importance to rest merely in speculation, as it had done in the minds of Plato and Seneca, who appear to have had conjectures of a similar nature. He determined therefore to bring his favorite theory to the test of actual experiment. But an object of that magnitude required the patronage of a prince, and a design so extraordinary met with all the obstructions, delays and disappointments, which, an age of superstition could invent, and which personal jealousy and malice 
could magnify and encourage. Prompted by the most ardent enthusiasm to be the discoverer of new continents, and fully sensible of the advantages that would result to mankind from such discoveries, he had the mortification to waste away 18 years of his life, after his system was well established in his own mind, before he could obtain the means of executing his designs. Happily for mankind, in this instance, a genius, capable of devising the greatest undertakings, associated in itself a degree of patience and enterprise, modesty and confidence, which rendered him superior, not only to these misfortunes, but to all the future calamities of his life. The greatest part of this period was spent in successive and fruitless solicitations, at Genoa, Portugal, and Spain. As a duty to his native country, he made his first proposal to the Senate of Genoa, where it was soon rejected. Conscious of the truth of his theory, and of his own abilities to execute his design, he retired without dejection from a body of men who were incapable of forming any just ideas upon the subject, and applied with fresh confidence to John II, King of Portugal, who had distinguished himself as the great patron of navigation, and in whose service Columbus had acquired a reputation which entitled him and his project to general confidence and approbation. But here he suffered an insult much greater than a direct refusal. After referring the examination of his scheme to the council, who had the direction of naval affairs, and drawing from him his general ideas of the length of the voyage and the course he meant to take, that great monarch had the meanness to conspire with this council to rob Columbus of the glory and advantage he expected to derive from his undertaking. While Columbus was amused with this negotiation, in hopes of having his scheme adopted and patronized, a vessel was secretly dispatched, by order of the king, to make the intended discovery. One of skill and perseverance in the pilot rendered the plot unsuccessful, and Columbus, on discovering the treachery, retired with an ingenuous indignation from a court capable of such duplicity. Having now performed what was due to the country that gave him birth and to the one that had adopted him as a subject, he was at liberty to court the patronage of any prince who should have the wisdom and justice to accept his proposals. He had communicated his ideas to his brother Bartholomew, whom he sent to England to negotiate with Henry VII. At the same time that he went himself into Spain to apply in person to Ferdinand and Isabella, who governed the United Kingdoms of Aragon and Castile. The circumstances of his brother's application in England, which appears to have been unsuccessful, is not to my purpose to relate, and the limits prescribed to this introduction will prevent the detail of all the particulars relating to his own negotiation in Spain. In this negotiation Columbus spent eight years, in the various agitations of suspense, expectation and disappointment, till, at length his scheme was adopted by Isabella, who undertook, as Queen of Castile, to destroy the expenses of the expedition, and declared herself, ever after, the friend and patron of the hero who projected it. Columbus, too, during all his ill success in the negotiation, never abated anything of the honors and emoluments which he expected to acquire in the expedition, obtained from Ferdinand and Isabella a full stipulation of every article contained in his first proposals. He was constituted High Admiral and Viceroy of all the seas, islands and continents which he should discover, with power to receive one-tenth of the profits arising from their productions and commerce. These offices and emoluments were to be hereditary in his family. These articles being adjusted, the preparations for the voyage were brought forward with rapidity, but they were by no means adequate to the importance of the expedition.